inside A heart so bitter by I will never Do your shit. Focus. Oh, that's right. You want to record this too. Just as a as a precaution, not that I don't trust you guys, but you know, you never know. People. What do you think? What did you What did you think? Um. Well, because like you've you you don't know us. We've just met each other, right? So what? Like what? Like what is the precaution for that? I'm I'm not against it. I think it's smart. I was just wondering what your thought process is on it. My thought process is just that um, in any video audio format, it's very easy to take people out of context by editing. So uh, to prevent anything that I say from being possibly used against me in the future and being taken out of context or vice versa, it's in my best interest to record everything. That way, in case this comes up online later on, people are telling me, oh, why did you say this? And I'm like, I, I didn't say, I didn't it that, say way. that that way. Yeah. I can upload my own thing and be like check it out this is the full context of what do I you think. see do you see that happening in other places like the media where it's like you see like here's a quote and then you're like that's not the quote that i saw that they're going all about oh definitely it happens all the time especially okay. especially with the mainstream media they'll do it all day to reinforce uh, to in, uh, reinforce their own narratives of course it's crazy so you and i can i tell people how you and i met uh, sure of course even though this is like the first time we've actually met yeah. You made a YouTube comment on, uh, I believe the video that we did was called Welcome Home Scranton Joe. Was it that or was it the interaction? It was the interaction. Okay. Did you watch the other one? No, no. Um, I actually got, if I can go on a little tangent. Go. Um, this is the weird thing is I go down YouTube rabbit hole. So I, if you look at other people's YouTube feeds, they tend to be like a few subjects. You look at mine, it's like a shotgun blast to the face uh, of different subject matter because I just click on everything. Um, so so the cats cooking. And yeah, so <laughs> so um, uh, I went down a little rabbit hole of... Um, of like cemetery videos of people going through cemeteries a lot of these old cemeteries some of them even like with the with the um uh with the goal of like raising awareness to like cemeteries that are not being well maintained and trying oh, yeah, to we get some around here exactly um and somehow i think it's because of that led me locally to you because there's another youtube video about uh, a mausoleum that's only about 22 minutes away that's in horrid shape and there's still bodies in that mausoleum and people are trying to get their loved ones out of it so this is michael and how do you say your last name again uh perillo perillo yes. and so you the thing that you commented on do you remember what you said or do you want me to read it uh you can read it you can read it okay so We've never done this before. Have somebody comment, but you're the first. I've asked a bunch of people to come talk to us mm -hmm. based off of comments. You're the only one that's ever said yes. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. So on that on that video, uh, Michael writes, and you're Eighth Man Standing five five six on yes. YouTube. Um, well, just I, I think if you just look Eighth Man Standing, you might be able to find me. I'm not sure. It's a small channel. Okay. I'm Muslim. I live in Scranton. I've attended these protests. The groups that organize these protests are well organized through WhatsApp groups, but are not well funded as someone else claimed. One of the main organizers literally gets picked up and dropped off by his mother. Nobody's funding any pro-Palestine protests. We raise funds if needed by donations from members of the Muslim community. Keep in mind, I've only seen us raise money for struggling Muslim families or to send to Gaza, not for protest activities. We just don't want our Muslim brothers and sisters, or anyone for that matter really, being indiscriminately killed in mass bombings, tortured in prison camps, denied basic human rights, being discriminized, discriminated to being discriminated due to ethnicity and religious beliefs, etc., by an aggressive and hateful occupying force that seeks to continue its genocidal actions and aren't even attempting to hide or obfuscate it. Correct. Do you do you stand by all that? Yes, I do. Okay. Can you explain that statement to me? Um, because where, there, because there is a perception, and it seems like you were you were trying to counter the perception. The, it was basically in response to a comment someone else made. Um, they were trying to claim, "Oh, these groups are very well financed," and and it like and that kind of hit my conspiratorial mind. Like, are you trying to like imply that there's some type of like upper echelon that's funding pro-Palestinian, like, come on. So I just wanted to set the record straight that, no, we are well-organized 
because like we have WhatsApp groups to organize these pro protests. Um, but like well funded, no. No, from what I've seen, like 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 I said, even the main guy who uh who I've seen organize these protests, uh NEPA for Palestine, mm -hmm. um, he's a white hippie dude <laughs> in his like I think like in his early twenties who gets picked up and dropped off by his mother. If you think like the, this dude is well financed and or come on, dude, like really. So that's why I commented on it. Um, but um, it's like if, if you want me to talk about like how we organize, that's one thing. If you want me to talk about the greater like the Palestinian Israel conflict, that's that's another thing. So I let's can do get let's let, if you want, let's do the organizing and then mm -hmm. let's jump into the Palestinian Israeli conflict. So from what I understand about the organizing, um, it's, it's just on WhatsApp. Um, it's a group called NEPA for Palestine. Now, who runs who runs WhatsApp? Is that Facebook? I have no idea, to be honest. Yeah, I think Facebook owns WhatsApp. I, I would assume because uh, a lot of monopolies exist within these uh, tech companies now. Truth. Um, so, like, basically, I don't know much about what goes on on the back end. I'm going to be completely honest. I just have a hard time believing that someone's well funded when like he's obviously a hippie with no money who gets dropped out by his mother. And you're going to try to convince me that this dude has I've a seen, lot of money. I've seen the signs. There's not a lot of money in that. No, yeah. <laughs> there's not. There's really not. Um, and a lot of people have to take off from their jobs. They have to travel long distances. It's not uncommon for people on the WhatsApp group uh, from what I've seen to be like, Hey, like I don't have the money to get to Washington. Can I, can I carpool with you guys? Is that possible? Can I, can somebody carpool with me or so, you know what I mean? Or like people saying, like, if people need a ride, we can take you. So like it's a it's a lot of um it's a lot of group effort. It's a lot of us banding together to try to raise awareness. So how like these aren't just local uh, protests. Um, Are they for for any PA for Palestine? I do believe that it's pretty local, but they also because you mentioned Washington. But they also communicate with other pro-Palestinian groups. So like from how I understand it, I think that what winds up happening is through WhatsApp, there winds up being a loose spider web connection of different pro-Palestinian groups that all intercommunicate with each other to try to um to try to organize some of the more bigger protests, like in Washington and stuff like that. Um, because even uh my friend who lives in New Jersey, I was very surprised. Um, him and a bunch of friends, they got on a bus that was a bus specifically chartered to go to the pro-Palestinian protest in D.C. In D.C. And I don't know who funded that or where they got the bus or how that because I'm I don't live in New Jersey and I'm not sure how he hooked up with this group. Um, but but yeah, but I have to assume I have to assume from everything I've seen that most likely it's just Muslims, uh, brothers and sisters raising money to fund this. When I see when I see those protests, it doesn't look like just Muslims. There's a lot of uh, non-Muslims who have come to the cause. I think just because like what's going on in Gaza is so in your face now. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Like unless like you're purposely not trying to see it, you're going to see it, especially if like you're within these pro-Palestinian groups. Um, people straight out of Gaza are part of these groups and they are sending videos and photos of dead bodies, of body parts strewn across the street, yeah. of like <clears throat> stuff that I can't look at. I stopped looking at from the beginning of the war because I, I don't have the heart to continue to look at people's mangled dead bodies, especially of children constantly 24 seven. So what, how, okay. So is there chapters of like groups? Like how does that how does that work? So in other words, like there's NEPA, but then there's what other ones all over the country or state or I, to, I sorry, I have to assume. Um, but uh, I only am familiar with NEPA for Palestine. That's the only one I'm familiar with because I can only do local protests if I even have the time to do local protests. Um I I I can't just like go to Washington whenever I feel like it and spend a day in Washington. And well, what, who are the people that can then? Because it seems like you I like I you like have a job or something. Or I think it's a lot of um, 
It's a, I don't know. I don't know. You have to ask them. I don't know how well, they have the free time Because when, when, when you look at stuff like that, you're like, how are all these people here? Do they have jobs? Like, how do they, how do they get the I'm, time off? I'm assuming they either take the time off. I Some people are, some, some Muslims are very, um... They're very passionate about it. I think I, sure. mentioned, I mentioned a sister, Joanna. Um, she literally quit her job that she's worked at for over a decade um, because her boss was pro-Israel. That's it. That's it. Isn't that weird? I could kind of understand it. Um, but uh, that's that's her choice. Um, I made impulsive decisions to leave jobs before, so I can't really judge her for that. Yeah, but she's like you. You're probably making an impulsive decision to go like a, a better job. She's making an impulsive decision to you know try to change no, the world. No, I've no, you want to go change the world? Decisions. No, I, no. I mean, I've made impulsive decisions just to leave a job and with no backup job just because I didn't like my boss. That's fair. <laughs> That's totally fair. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. It's not a good idea, and I don't like that about myself. But uh, I, I, yeah. Well, you shouldn't be in a place you don't want to be. You know what um, I mean? You should also kind of plan ahead and not just act on impulse. A little bit, yeah. I'm I'm with you on that. Um, all right. Can I what what led you to what led you and then when did this happen that you like what was your life like before you converted to Islam? Um well I guess a little bit of backstory is that um I I grew up in foster care. Um, uh-huh. I was I was born uh of a drug addled mother. Um I was born with uh with from what i was told every drug imaginable in my system i was born premature. oh your mom was okay yeah, i was born premature semi-comatose i had to stay the first six months of my life uh in the hospital in an incubator right um that's so terrible man i'm sorry it's, it's fine as what it is but um the first family i got sent to was my god family and i stayed with them up until i was 13. now uh i learned later on that my godfather wound up getting lung cancer uh-huh. And the children and youth basically told my godparents, um, you either adopt him now. The reason that they hadn't adopted me up until then is because like they didn't even terminate my biological mother's rights until I was seven. Okay. That's okay. even though she never got any better and she never and there was just issue after issue after issue every visitation I had with right. Her. Um, and then my godfather got pancreatic cancer, beat that. Then he got then RCA outsourced to Mexico. He didn't have a stable income. So it was like one thing after another that pushed back my adoption with my God family. Uh, then when I turned 13, apparently children, you told them, um, you're not licensed or certified to take care of teenagers. You either need to adopt him now or we're going to move him. Um, and given the fact move that- you where? Just start bouncing me around foster care up in, up in Pocono Mountain, basically. Okay. They didn't even keep my case. They literally transferred my case to some, you know, agency up in Pocono Mountain. Um, but uh, he got diagnosed with lung cancer. And so they thought they, they convinced him that, oh, we're going to find him a good home. They did not. They bounced me around foster care up until I was 19 when I graduated high school. Jesus. In between that time, when I was about 15, um, they came to me, uh, the agency, and they told me, um, your foster, your, your godfather's dying. He's in hospice. Um, and so they asked me, they were like, you can see him now or you can see him next week. I was like, of course, I want to see him now. I got to see him now. I came to the hospital to hospice and uh, my godmother was there and uh, he was in the bed. Uh, he wasn't conscious. Um, and uh, my godmother told me that everybody had seen him at that point. I was the only one who didn't. Um, he was conscious maybe for a minute. The time I was there and I held his hand and I talked to him. And um, uh, I left that night and he passed away that night. Hmm. Now, is he basically, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of like your dad. That's the only father figure I ever had. Yeah. Um, I signed myself out of foster care with the idea that I had a family to come back to. One of the things that killed me, the very cruel, very cruel. One of the things that killed me was Wait, um, who's very cruel. What's very cruel? foster care agencies okay. and, the, and the people who run it. Okay. One of the things they like to shove in my face when I was misbehaving is, uh, oh, you don't have a family. If your family wanted you, they wouldn't have gave you away. They say stuff like that. They say stuff like that. Okay. They're very cruel. One thing that kept me going, one thing that kept me from not even killing myself was I thought I had a family to come back to. 
I was mistaken. I came back. Uh, the only one who seemed to accept me back was my godmother. The rest of my family didn't want, want anything to do with me. My god family, that is, because I don't know my biological family. And did, did that family not want because they they looked at you as trouble or did they look at you as? That's basically how they how they framed it. They framed it as if, um, oh, he's no good. But that was the narrative from like the second, like I signed myself out of foster care when they had no knowledge of me. You understand? And then mm -hmm. every mistake I made afterwards was just reinforcing that narrative. Yeah, the, the original feeling. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and obviously I was very traumatized. I'm going to be honest with you. I have uh, depression. I have, uh, 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 complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Um, and, um, I struggle with my mental health and obviously I was struggling a lot when I signed myself out of foster care. Can you explain to me what complex post-traumatic stress disorder so post is? Post-traumatic stress disorder I know what that is. is based off of one event. Complex post-traumatic mm. stress disorder is when you are traumatized over and over mm. and over again through a series of events. Okay, I understand. So that's why they consider mine complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Copy, okay. Because it's been a series of different traumatizing events throughout my lifetime. Um, so, I, so yeah, to get into, because you mentioned that you used to be an addict. I want yes. to get into this too. Okay, so let's I go. fell into drugs really heavily. And how um, old were you? I was uh, 19, okay. 20. Um, first, it began with marijuana, obviously. The gateway drug. They, they yeah. call it a gateway, but it's not really a gateway drug. It's not. It's not. Um, the problem is that when you're in that mind state, you don't want to be in the present. Correct. So you seek any way not to be in the present. And then whatever does that better, you gravitate to. Yeah, whatever takes reality away. Exactly. Yeah. I fell into spice pretty hard. The The thing that kept me away from the harder drugs was the fact that um, I knew that I was born addicted to everything. Spice to me was marketed as like um, synthetic marijuana. Oh, it's safe. Some of the stuff that we were smoking, we later learned on like uh, one was called bonsai was synthetic heroin available where um when i was 19 so this was like 2012 2013 at any gas station any gas <laughs> station any head shop what? Any, yeah, like head shops and stuff any, like that yeah, yeah uh, any smoke shop yeah there was no regulation on it for years when it was when it was first out um are and, you huh and me me and my friends had a little um uh uh system going where uh we would befriend the high school students okay mm -hmm. because they weren't old enough to buy it themselves all right we take their money we go buy it we'd roll it because we were the only ones who knew how to roll mm -hmm. okay and then we would chief the hell out of their blunts and smoke most of their shit well basically what are you gonna do about it like you can't yeah. buy it bro yeah like, who are you gonna tell yeah yeah we're gonna hand it to you when we're done with it yeah yeah uh not cool but um I shouldn't even be smiling about it because it's dumb. It it led to me having a really bad habit. Um, I robbed people. I um I on I, spice. I, I, yeah, I stole to from, get money to get on money. Yeah, I I stole from my own godmother. I I stole two hundred dollars from her account. Um, which obviously just reinforced my the rest of my family's narrative, mm -hmm. my god family's narrative. So um, uh. So what happened was um, I just hit a point where I couldn't look myself in the mirror. And uh, one night I had a dream and no one ever convinced me otherwise that, that this wasn't my godfather telling me that I was going to die if I didn't stop. I had a dream and in the dream, uh, my godfather used to have a habit of taking us to Manning's. Okay. So we'd be in his minivan and he'd take us to Manning's to go get ice cream. And uh, in the dream, um, I was in the front seat of his minivan and I didn't even see him. I just heard his voice and he said, you got to stop. And so my crazy ass bought 40 grams of spice and smoked it in two days. And I said, if this doesn't kill me, I'm never touching it again. And, oh, and okay. What now? What is 40 grams of spice? I've never smoked spice spice. So what is. Okay, let me give you let me give you um uh an idea how dangerous what I did was. I smoked forty grams of I think the one that I smoked was called Cloud Nine. Uh -huh. And there were ten gram bags at a head shop and there was four different flavors. That's why I wound up being forty grams. I smoked that within forty eight hours, uh over a weekend. 
that Sunday, when I finished the last blunt, my friend calls me. He said, dude, you're okay. I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm fine. He said, did you see the news? I was like, no, I'm high off my ass. I'm, I'm, I'm out there. Mm -hmm. He's like, dude, 128 people just went to the hospital last night for overdosing on Spice. No. How much do they smoke? Not as I much. I have no idea. Definitely not 40 grams in 48 hours. <laughs> Wow. Do you th so do you think that that was divinity? No, no, I think I built up an, a, a crazy tolerance to it. So you don't think that like you said you set out some edict to be like if this doesn't kill me, I'll never do it again and you don't do you, do you think that there was a a divine hand in there somewhere? No, I think that I just had a crazy you just think, tolerance you just think at that you were point. Like and yeah, and that my body could handle I think a lot of people were ODing because they were taking too much of it. But then again, like I said, like one of them was called bonsai that disappeared off the shelf, and we later mm -hmm. learned because it was synthetic heroin. So if you like, if like you don't, if you don't know what you're getting, and you don't know what chemicals are actually sprayed on it, and you think, oh, like this is just some derivative of like THC, and then you smoke all blunt of it, yeah, you could, you could have a. It's bad crazy time. that these are in like gas stations and head shops, and you can't really find them now. I think some places still sell them over the like under. The it was like the kratom like now. Yeah, or Kratom. Um, but uh, I'm glad that I stopped when I did because I stopped. Um, and then, like, I, that's when all the regulations really started to hit and they really started to crack down on all the I think that's shops. when they realized, uh-oh. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they really started to crack down on all the people selling it. And then I, I learned later, like, years later, people were telling me that people were in Scranton were going out collecting, like, weeds and stuff like that um, and then drying them out and spraying them with Raid. The and, bug killer? Yeah, and then packaging it as spice and then selling it to people. Jesus. Are you happy you got out before that? Yes. I'm very happy I got out <laughs> Can you imagine? That. Dan, and that's, and Dan, that's, Dan, wait. Rain! <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I believe, Rain! that's why I believe that that was my, my godfather trying to tell me, like, I had to stop because. I believe like, in stuff like that. I believe mm -hmm. that, like, stuff like that happens. And it's the thing that kills me the most because I think about this, uh, I try not to think about it often anymore, and, and I'm going to get into why I'm even bringing all this up. I try not to think about this too much because it's bad for my mental health. Sure. But the thing that, that really devastates me is that my godfather could wait for me. He could wait for me in his dying moments to see me before he died. My family couldn't wait for me to get out of foster care. They, they, I, they, this whole narrative of, oh, he's a bad kid. Oh, he's a deadbeat. Da, 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 da. That, that was that basically, narrative? that was basically, that was basically being told to my godmother because she was living in the projects. Mm -hmm. You know, dad was dead. Like she, her whole life was taking care of little infants for foster care. That was the only career she ever knew. She never even learned how to drive. And she was old enough to be my godmother, uh, old enough to be my grandmother. Um, so when I signed out of the foster care, she was living in the projects. I had to move in with her on the projects and the locally or uh, it was in Dunmore, actually okay. Dunmore projects at the time. And, um, luckily though, the guy who ran the projects at that time was a dickhead. He, uh, um, he was really nice. You're to, my, to say that he was really nice to my mom or well, my godmother. He was really nice to my godmother. So she let him know, like, he's staying with me. He has nowhere else to go. And he was actually really nice about it and didn't, and didn't give her any flack about it. Um, but, like, if I, I felt like from that moment, um, I like that narrative was immediate. And one of the people who was pushing that narrative was my, my older godbrother. Um, I'm not going to say any names just because I don't want to, you know. My older godbrother and his whole thing, and it's so petty, and my, my godmother has told me this many times, he felt like I got too much attention as a kid. Right. He was the oldest. He was 10 years older than me. When I was eight, he was 18. Right. What do you mean you didn't get enough attention, bro? Oh, he got too much attention. Yeah, you had, you had he still, 10 years of attention before I did. Dude, he, he still holds his grudge against me. Got to let that go. He still holds his grudge against me. It's ridiculous. And, um, but, uh, I, I, um, how Islam, does this, how does this get you all the way? It, yeah. So Islam, Islam, were you anything before? 
Roman Catholic, but I really like that's like I, I like how one comedian said uh he said I'm Roman Catholic in the same way that uh an elephant would uh an elephant would be a bird if it was born in a tree. Um <laughs> basically like what the fuck? <laughs> I'm gonna use that one. Yeah. You know, so I was born and baptized Roman Catholic, but like even my God family who was Roman who was Roman Catholic never really forced it on us. I did ask my godmother later on, why didn't you ever Really forced that into us. And she said, um, because when she was a kid, the nuns were really mean and they used to beat her. And she's like, I'm not going to put my kids through that. And she was of the mind that, um, that as long as you know of God and Jesus and you're all right, you don't need other people to tell you what God wants of you. God will let you know what he I wants don't need. I don't, uh, I don't need buildings made of stone or houses made of wood. I am everywhere. Exactly. And yeah. even, and even Jesus, peace be upon him, preached that he didn't preach these big giant chapels. He preached on the street, on the street, on the street. So, you know, yeah. So, um, uh, Islam, I think for me, especially with my mental health, it gives me a sense of community that I never had before. So how, how did you, how did you get like introduced to it? How did you, how did you start walking the path? How did you, did you meet? Like, I, I don't know the process. I, I met a Muslim woman who simply gave me a book. She gave me a book. It was called Towards Understanding Islam. I tried to look it up. I can find it, but there's a lot of authors who have wrote books named Towards Understanding Islam. Uh -huh. um, but I read it, and a lot of it already really just fit in with what I already believed instinctually. Um, I've never prayed to Jesus. That's never made any sense to me. I've never prayed to the Virgin Mary. That's never made any sense to me. I could have swore that Jesus told his disciples, pray to God. He's, you know, when he taught them how to pray, he said, thy father who art in heaven, not me. He said, thy father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He never said, I he never said me. He never said me. Yeah. So I never prayed to Jesus. I prayed to God, to Allah. Um, and so basically Islam is just that it's basically just stop praying to deities stop praying to anybody but god the allah is just the arabic word for one god and that god is the abrahamic god that god is the same god of abraham same god of moses same god of jesus is just it's um we believe that those scriptures have been tainted that they've been messed with and there's plenty of historical evidence. So even the scriptures, like the New the Testament and the, the Old Testament. Testament? The Old Testament. If you okay. ask any rabbi, do you have the original Torah? No, they do not. You ask, we all know, do you have the original books of the Gospels? No, they do not. The Gospels we know were not documented until... Was it like 300 with Constantinople? Mm, or? Not necessarily that much. I think the oldest, I think the... the I'd have to Dead Sea Scrolls, I think, again. are the oldest. I, I think the the one that's dated the closest to the life of Jesus might be Paul. It might be. Oh, it might be. Yeah, yeah. It might be Paul. Um, but uh, the and I don't look. And I tell this even to Christians. If you're a Christian, that's awesome. That's awesome. That means you have a, a moral compass. That means that you're being guided by something. I don't care what your religious beliefs are. If you find um meaning and substance and a way in life that 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 helps you in any religion good for you good for you I, I'm, I'm glad for you um my personal beliefs do not need to dictate yours and even within the quran that's our holy text and the quran literally just means the recitation one thing i was interested to learn was that um unlike the bible that's read the recitation is recited it's basically saying they don't like to say it's saying but it's saying so the book is saying the, the yeah it's supposed to be basically basically so, so what was the what was the process for you to go from roman catholic to well, yeah, I, you said you so, met this muslim woman yeah, and she gave and you the I, book and i read that and then after that i got a copy of the english translation of the quran <clears throat> i read that and i saw other than the fact that it other other than the fact that it um uh uh, it doesn't condemn slavery. Um, I see. I, I've had no moral. What doesn't? What doesn't? What doesn't, what doesn't condemn slavery? The Quran. Oh, it does not. But then again, the Bible doesn't either. So that's, well, that's still that still fits in with the Abrahamic tradition. I can't really argue with that. 
Uh, and unlike the Bible, which states that you can beat your slave as much as you want, as long as he can get up in a few days, uh, the Quran states that you need to treat your slaves with dignity. See, like we hear we hear all this stuff, you know, like you hear all this stuff from mainstream news. You hear all this stuff from talking heads that are supposed to know what they're talking about. And they say that, um, you know, Islam is a is a. What would, you, what would you call it? A uh, not aggressive, but like it seems like it, they, they try to convey Islam as more of like a, a a more violent religion. And then I, you know, I then I go, but like, what about the what about like the Spanish Inquisition? And what about like all the things that Catholics did and and Christians? Like, I don't know if there's really a difference. And they're all the Abrahamic gods. There, there really isn't, unfortunately. Um, from the from the moment that there has been one God, there has been killing in his name. And, uh, and it doesn't matter what Allah tells us, people are going to kill each other for their beliefs. Even, even though like the Bible strictly prohibits it, even though the Quran strictly prohibits it. Um, you know, you have people like the Taliban who will justify blowing themselves up and killing a lot of people you know, in the name of Allah, like, no, dude, you're going to hell. The The Quran states that you're going to hell. So this, all these virgins is not a real thing or? No, there's nothing in the Quran that states anything about 72 virgins, period. Where did that come from? Um, Something that happened after 9-11, I guess. I have no idea. The only thing. <laughs> what? That, that I guess, because that's the first time I started hearing about that was after 9-11, basically. The whole 72 virgin thing um because i was like reading the quran i was waiting to see something like that um the only thing it says about women within um uh, jenna which is heaven uh is that um that um there will be women of uh fair age and uh equal gaze uh and that they will have eyes as beautiful as pearls that's it but there's no like 72 no and you've, I, I mean, obviously you've read the Quran. Yes. So why, why, what, what is it that permeates that narrative? I think I've always been of the mind that, um, much like the cults in the sixties and seventies, uh-huh. uh, like with every religion, um, you can twist any religion to your own narratives and then get people to do what you want them to do. And I feel like so that's about basically control. I feel like that's basically what these these groups do, these these terrorist groups. Um they take the Quran, they twist it to their own narrative. And they and, and they then, prey on, and on they prey on foolish people. Not foolish people, people who are in a bad way in life. Okay. Fair enough. They're not necessarily foolish. Desperate like, people. Desperate people, exactly. And if you look at like the people of, of Palestine, um, who are treated the way they, they are, I'm not saying that they are justified and 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 bombing. Um, but if you feel like, if you feel like you have no freedom, you have no choices, you have no future, um, you, like your brother was shot on the street by an Israeli soldier, soldier in the West Bank for no, for no reason, uh, you're tormented, your homes are taken, you might get to a point where you think blowing yourself up is a good idea. Well, because what's left? Because what's left? Because yeah. you push somebody into a corner. I'm not saying it's right. And I'm not saying that I, I condone it. But you push someone so far, they're gonna break. Well, people who remember what was what was the uh, what was the documentary with the guy who built the uh, the bulldozer? You know what I'm talking about? No, not at all. Killdozer, killdozer, Kill right? Like that guy's not a Muslim. He's probably he's probably an atheist. But he they pushed him. They pushed. They him, pushed him. And they pushed him. And they pushed him. And they pushed him. And guess what? He was like, okay. Um, from what I understand, the narrative is that they even tried to steal his business. His yeah, they tried to put him out of right, business. They tried to take right his out land. from under. Him. Yep. And so he said, okay, you're gonna try to steal my land. I'm going to demolish your town. And well, he only went after the people who were on exactly, the council. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Which is great. You and gotta I, watch kill those. Oh yeah. I I am in full support of the man. If I, the only thing I uh. I regret is the fact that he took his own life. I think that if he didn't, he would still be held up as he's held up as a martyr. Now, I think that a lot of people would have came to his legal defense had he not shot. Possibly. Himself. Possibly. Well, now I got to watch this. So I, I it seems like so here's like here's like a question that like I would have. So it seems like what's been going on 
in Palestine has been going on at least for the majority of like, let's say my father's life. My father's born in the fifties. So the whole time, you know, if my grandfather was still around, it wouldn't be because what was that? 1946 was when all that crazy shit happened over there. Longer, longer. It dates back longer. So, well, like I'm talking about, like the British and the UN, and like as it is today. Well, so you have to understand the historical context in which this is happening. Okay, so to as a as a very very brief history on this, if you want, you can. There are podcasts that go like 20 hours in depth into this stuff. Um, have you ever heard of pogroms? The pogroms, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are very. Those happen all the time in Europe, okay? And during the pogroms, and some of them were state-sanctioned, state um, Jewish communities were targeted, attacked. Their homes and businesses were uh, were decimated or, or burnt down. Uh, they were beaten within inches of their lives, if not killed. Now, these uh, are the Jews that are getting beat. Jews, yeah. The Jews. The um, Jews. They were, their, their wives and daughters were raped. And at a certain point, um, the Zionist movement happened. Now, the Zionist movement as an answer to that, an answer to that, basically saying we need to get out of Europe. And I don't disagree with them for that feeling that need they need to get out of Europe. I can understand that feeling. Um, when the first pilgrims started coming to Palestine, they were welcomed with open arms because they weren't trying to. Because a lot of the people who were living there um, weren't trying to outright take the land yet. They were just trying to integrate. Yeah. Which is important. You have yes. to integrate with. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but. Um, Pogroms. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. I'm not even going to try to remember because I'm going to get it wrong. Say guy, yeah, gonna, that's yeah. fine. I, but you know what? I mean? Look, cut the camera to me. Anyone who fact checks this because we because because we're because we're not scholars is an asshole. <laughs> you know, we're saying we don't know. We don't know. Look it up. If we're wrong, correct us. But and this is how conversations happen. We don't know if there's questions we ask them and, and move the fuck on with your life. Dan, me. Um, I'm a genius. And everything that I say today is 100% true. You don't need to fact check it. Just trust me. Uh, back to you. Okay, wait, me, 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 me. <laughs> if I was a better producer, I'd be looking this stuff up right now and trying to correct it as it goes along. But that's not going to happen. Yeah, worst yeah. producer ever. <laughs> All right, back to Michael. It's fine. Um, so um, Hitler did nothing to alleviate this feeling amongst the European Jews that they weren't going to be exterminated off the planet if they didn't get the hell out of Europe. Well, neither did America. America, America, America turned the ships around and sent them back. Yeah, exactly. And on top of that, um, a lot of Hitler's ideals came from uh, Ford. Uh, came from oh uh, yeah, Ford Motor Company. Well, it's the eugenics and yeah, all that he shit. He was yeah, very yeah. much into eugenics. Um, he also and Bill pushed, Gates' dad. He he also pushed um the um uh the I forget what the book was called, but it was a it was a it was a a, a book basically of anti Jewish anti Semitist conspiracy theories that he pushed to the public. Um, Hitler spoke very highly of what was Ford's Henry Ford. Ford. Henry Ford. Thank yeah, they were, you. They were buddies. Of Henry Ford. Um, so the only difference with America is there really wasn't pogroms in America, but there was still plenty of anti-Semitism, unfortunately. Oh, there was Nazi rallies in New York. Yeah, there was Nazi the rallies. 30s. There was and Nazi rallies right up the street. No. Did you know that? No. At the, the, the armory. armory. Really? Oh, yeah. I went up to the Historical Society. There are Nazis marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. What? Yeah. Go up and look. It It wasn't just a thing like... In 1930s United States, the Nazi party was huge. It was a big deal. Walt Disney was a big part of it. Yep. And they're not turning out real well right now, but let's, <laughs> who cares about them? So the just to give context, we interject and, you know, just to make sure people are like, hey, this this was here and it was it was prevalent. Mm -hmm. So the, the Zionist movement started being more. No, can you explain Zionist for the for the because I so the, you hear all these different definitions of Zionism. So Zionism is not a religious movement. It's a political movement of this, that's basically the idea that um, the Jewish people need a home state because without a home state, um, they will be continuously persecuted. And they look at that as Zion, which makes them Zionists. Exactly. OK, so um, they got more militaristic. And I think it was in 1956 was the first pogrom. And that was the first real like 
killing of Palestinians and forcing them out of large swaths of their own territory. Now, at that time, too, though, now, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it wasn't really like a nation state. It was just like an area of land where like you had farmers and you had uh, nomadic people. You had. Am, am I wrong in that assessment? Before well, maybe before I'll ask this, this way, like you use the term Palestine, like are, was Palestine a country? Uh, Palestine um, goes all the way back to the Old Testament, the, the Philistines. Think about um, think about um, what's um, uh, David. Mm-hmm. David versus Goliath. Goliath was a Palestinian. Okay. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Yep. This area has always been inhabited by the Philistines. Okay. Um, up until World War One, it was controlled by the Ottoman Empire. Okay. Obviously, after World War One, the Ottoman Empire did no longer exist. They fell, um, and their territory was divided amongst the European nations. Um, and so, from what I understand, Britain took over uh, the uh, the Palestinian regions. Um, and after World War Two, um, they were kind of like I don't they were like, deal with this. you know, this is a good this is a good way to get rid of the Jews out of Europe. You have to understand that a lot of politicians supported uh, the Zionist movement, um, not out of a feeling of like, oh, we love the Jewish people. Oh, this is going to be so good for them. No, it was we don't want the Jews in our country. This is a good way to get them out. Interesting. You understand? Interesting. I do. The Jewish people have every reason to be paranoid. I agree with them. I love the Jewish people. If you go on my YouTube channel, one of the first videos I have uploaded is the Nuremberg trial films. So if anybody ever tries to come to me and say, hey, the Holocaust is a lie, I can pull up my phone and say, watch this three hour fucking uh, video of, the, of, the of, of, of the Nuremberg yeah. trial film that shows irrefutable proof of genocide and, and, and mass killings of Jews, gypsies, and basically anybody who Mentally wasn't a retarded, Nazi. handicapped, yeah, basically yep. anybody who wasn't a Nazi. So, yeah, no, I have all, all the sympathy in the world for the Jewish people. Um, but as some of the protest signs have stated, one genocide does not justify another. Now, how would you define genocide? Uh, genocide? Yeah. Uh, mass killings of people based on like indiscriminately? race, indiscriminately oh. based on race, ethnicity, religion, you know, but it can go down to like, like think about the genocides in Rwanda. These sure. people were the killed Hutus because the Tutsis. because the Tutsis had different shaped noses. Different shaped noses and they yeah. killed hundreds of thousands of these people. Remember when we had Aja and or mm-hmm. uh, Ushu, Ushu t- Ushu my buddy's from the Congo. His mm-hmm. family was uh the Tutsis came after his family and killed his whole village. And then he said to me, he goes, we can tell how you look by the bridge of your nose, the size yeah, of your that's forehead. That's the only difference. That's the yeah. that's crazy. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. So sometimes it could be down to just stuff like that. Um, it's it's absolutely insane what you can get people to mass kill people over. It's, uh, you're absolutely right. Well, when you strike up enough fear in people, they'll do just about anything. <clears throat> the and the thing that I, the thing that kind of aggravates me with the with the modern uh, state of Israel mm-hmm. um, is the fact that um, Netanyahu is a maniac. Any 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 type of way to say that he isn't is is absolutely insane given what he's doing. And you also have to understand that I Ham- saw a video of him saying that like we need to make sure that we fund Hamas so that they never yes. have a Palestinian state. Yes, you have yeah. to understand that he um there was a more um there was a more um what's the word I'm looking for? There was a party uh, for Palestine, a governmental party for Palestine that was open to the two-state solution and was pushing for it. Um, Netanyahu and his and his government started funding Hamas specifically because they they did not want that, and they wanted them to create chaos. They wanted them to create chaos because the the more they can justify taking their land, the better. They don't want a two-state solution. They want all of that territory, and. I don't think that's ever going to stop. What happens after they take over Gaza? They're going to move to the West Bank. They're already moving into the West Bank. There's Look up the illegal settlements in the West Bank. They're already pushing into the West Bank as we speak. So then they're going to take over the West Bank. Then what? I, where, where are you, where, you're going to be happy then? 
Hitler wasn't happy then. St- you know, Stalin wasn't happy. You know, or uh, it these these type of megalomaniacal maniacs are not happy. Okay, until they have everything. I don't think that Netanyahu is going to be happy until maybe he takes over the entire Middle East. Do you think? Do you think that the? Do you think that the Israelis Israelis had prior knowledge to the events of October? Uh, what was it? Seventh. Um, I think that's very likely. I can't say with any certainty. Uh, but given the fact that um nothing goes in and out of Gaza without their knowledge, uh, the fact that um they're heavily monitored with cameras and surveillance systems and everything like y'all didn't have how do you not see paragliders y'all didn't have one hint and then it took them i think it said uh, i took the israeli army hours 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 four hours to get to that territory um and then i think it's also suspicious that uh, the fighter jets were like four hours or something there were already soldiers in that area and then they pulled out before the attack i can't confirm that but that seems it seems it seems like something i i read I can't confirm that either, but there was an is there was an Israeli man. Um, it's, he's on my. Uh, I have the video on my Facebook um feed. Um, who was saying basically calling out the government at, like, and this guy wasn't like um anti-Zionist, definitely a Zionist. He was just upset that the government allowed this to happen, and he feels that they knew it was going to happen, and they did not care who died. I saw some of that. I saw people speaking to that in Israel. Yeah. yeah. The Israelis, ha- they didn't. Just, it, it seems to me they didn't chase that down to disprove it. Yeah, no. And um, we've hit a very dangerous situation with the Israeli state, given the fact that just like, um, just like if you look like look at the, like the Hitler Youth, right? So some of the fiercest fighting uh, that the Russians had to go against uh, when they were uh, encircling Berlin was not you know, uh, grown men, it was children because they were fanatical. They didn't care if they died. They were raised because of the Fuhrer. They were raised to believe in that ideology. Uh, I think that Israel is, is, is facing a similar situation. Uh, They are raised in Israel to believe that that land is theirs. God has ordained, Allah has ordained that that land be theirs. And so if they are the chosen people, if, uh, if God has chosen them, then they can do whatever they want can the and same, be morally justified in it. Can the same be said about the Palestinians? Um, uh, From a... Like, in other words, like, God from, ordained this for us. This is our land. Do you see what, you see what I mean? I think, that, I think that for the Palestinians, it has nothing to do with what God ordained or our law. It has to do with the fact that their ancestors have lived there for generation after generation after generation after generation. They can trace their generations back for thousands of years in Palestine. And if, you're genera- and if you can trash your, trace your ancestry back thousands of years in an area, obviously you're going to be very attached to it and you're not going to want to let it go. Okay, can I push back on you for a second? Uh, sure. Uh, isn't there a lot of... Uh, evidence that the Israelites were back there thousands of years also because isn't that the place of of uh, you know a lot of things that happened in the Old Testament happen in that area and the and the is is well the the, the Jewish faith claims that do you see what I mean where it's like if two people there are two groups that don't get along but they believe the same like God's on their side do you see what I'm saying so like in that at that moment it's like how is there ever going to be peace? Because both sides agree that agree that they're righteous. It's it's become very toxic, unfortunately. Um, if you and the, um, I think that some Muslims won't want me saying this, but the Palestinians, um, a lot of them have been just as ex- just as pushed to the extreme, um, because of what Israel has done to them. So they've been pushed to the extreme where they don't want any Jews in their territory anymore. But if you go back um, before the, actually, even after the pogroms, um, there's um, uh, the head of the uh, Islamic Council for Scranton. Um, we have an Islamic Council for Scranton? Yes. Did not know that. Do you um, know this person? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. He's, he's, he's at every Jummah. Uh, that's, um, that's, uh, we pray on Fridays. He'd be a cool guy to talk to, don't you think? 
It, uh, if he's willing. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, that's Brother Farouk. Brother Farouk, uh, okay. Brother Farouk. Um, he is Palestinian. Uh-huh. Um, and he was talking about how when he was a little kid, it was not uncommon uh, for a Jewish mother um, to help a, uh, a Palestinian family um, suckle their child. That if uh, a mother was not producing milk, okay, they could take it to their neighbor. It didn't matter what they believed, if they were Christian, if they were Muslim, if they were Jewish. It wasn't uncommon for- That's saving a baby. Yeah. To, oh, your baby can't feed? It doesn't matter. I'm Jew- Who cares? Give me your child. I will help you feed your child. Um, things have become so extreme on both ends that the Palestinians don't want the Jews there based on, solely on the fact that they're Jews. And the Jews don't want the Palestinians there because they feel like they're entitled to that land. Um, I don't understand where we go from here. They want a two-state solution. How do you get to a two-state solution, especially after what's happened in Gaza? Well, I, how are you going to convince these? I'm sorry. How are you going to convince these people in Gaza who, who, who? I mean, definitely. How there, there have been so many killings in Gaza now of innocent men, women, and children that there, that there definitely can't be not one Palestinian in Gaza who doesn't have a family member who's been killed by the Israeli state in an indiscriminate bombing at this point. So, how are you going to convince? If put yourself in that position. Yeah, we okay. just did all this. Uh, now, do you want your state? Exactly. <laughs> They're so, like, no. Exactly. So like imagine like you're, you're like you can't get food, you can't get water, you can't get anything. You're basically in an open air prison in Gaza your entire life. And then by what you feel is an occupying hostile occupying force. Um, and then they start indiscriminately bombing you and killing your family. And then I come to you and I say, no, no, hey, calm down. We can have a two state solution. Yeah. Oops. You see what I mean? Things have been pushed to such an extreme. I don't I don't understand where we go from here. I don't I don't see. I think it's very sad, but I don't see an outcome that doesn't wind up in more bloodshed, or World War Three, or World War Three. Unfortunately, if you look at the if you look at the overall um, uh, global climate right now, um, and I tell this, and I said this to someone at my job too. We were talking about this. I said, if you want to look at what's going to uh, lead to World War Three, you can't look at World War Two. World War Two is inextricably linked to World War One. You have to look at what. What led up to World War One, and a lot of what led up to World War One was a lot of incompetent leadership, a lot of people who were hitting the gas and not hitting the brake, and a lot of um, spider webbing treaties like a domino. So the second that the Franz Ferdinand, Franz yeah. Ferdinand was shot and killed, those dominoes tumbled, and all the leadership in Europe with these dynasties of like people who are inbred to such an extent and had no idea had no idea he's idea, probably not wrong and, no. and, he's probably not wrong and had oh, and, oh he's very right <laughs> and had no idea what it was to live as a common man these people had no reference. oh yeah they never they never lived one never, day just no they, in the field they they had the idea before World War One of gentlemanly warfare. Yeah. Oh, we're having a dispute about our territory. So like people were just like toy soldiers. Okay, I'm gonna put all my little toy soldiers in a line and, you and aim them your, at each other. And you can put yours in a line and whoever survives, okay, well then that settles our dispute. But we'll do it amicably, we'll do it nicely, we'll put in some rules of engagement. What a crazy um, way to war. But but that's how they thought about it. They thought about it as like these are just little toys. You know what I mean? This we play war and it's yeah. a, and their it's lives. A, and and on top of that, um a lot of the military leadership back then um they did not view like we view war as a destructive tendency now. Um back then they didn't. They view war as something glorious. It was still very much like the same idea of like the Roman, or like the Romans Gladiators. or the Greeks, or, yeah. the, or or like much of what war was for most of human history. Um, this is a noble venture. This is this is where um yes, it's bloody, it's brutal, but this is where uh the the uh humanity shines the most because this is where you see the best of humanity also come out with the worst, right? Yeah. And you can see that. That's one of the things that fascinates me about military history and military engagements is that sometimes you do see the best of humanity within war. But put in a terrible situation. A terrible I'd, I'd situation. rather I'd rather I'd rather that person who ends up being courageous and valiant living in their hometown when something happens that they could be courageous and valiant there. Exactly. And we could be like, oh, Bob was amazing. 
Exactly. And but now you're right, man. They look back at it as like this is. You agree with that? I mean, you're a history buff. Like mm-hmm. the war was. It was, well, I mean, it you, was sexy to the people who had the money. Yeah, and I mean, it, you go back throughout history, and and war was one of the number one ways where the common man could rise above his station. You know, he could find a way to elevate himself in society. So you look at the American Revolution. You know, you look at who the founding fathers were. Um, you know, Alexander Hamilton, I think, was 19 when all that started. And he, through war, elevated himself to be secretary of the Treasury under Washington. You know, like, and he used war to do that. A lot of those people did that. A lot of people have done that throughout history. Um, you know, just the common man uses a career in the military over time, I, I just came this morning from um, a, uh, a, a big announcement at Lackawanna College. One of my good friends, Mark Volk, you know, the president of a college, he elevated himself through a military career and showing leadership and learning and became the president of a college. You know, that's how a lot of people have done it. And it's still it's still very much the case today. You mm-hmm. can still uh, elevate your station in life through the military. Um, I wanted to go into the military um, in my early 20s, but I did not. Too much want, spice. <laughs> but I, I did not. This was after actually after I got off the spice. Yes. Um, I wanted to go into the military, um, but uh, I wanted to specifically go into the Navy. I wanted to be trained as an underwater welder. Oh, really? Yes. Because they make a lot of money. They could have used mm-hmm. you for the Norm Street Nord Stream pipeline that day. They make they make a lot of money. Um, some of the best paying careers that you could it's ever a couple have. hundred bucks an hour or something, isn't it? I mean, if especially if you're a saturation diver. Yeah. They they make they make like basically enough money to retire. If, if I started my early twenties, like I probably years. would have been able to retire by thirty five. Yeah. Um, saturation diving. If I ever got the chance to do that, so dangerous though. It's so dangerous. Um, but uh, I, um. So I went to, I went to the recruitment office, right? Uh-huh. Uh huh. Which is right there uh, by uh, Sheets, the one yes. right there by Sheets. Yeah. I go over, I go to open up the Navy door, and it's locked. And the guy on the Army side opens up the door. He's like, he's like, oh, they're out to lunch. I'm like, the Navy is out to lunch. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, yeah. He's like, I can get you started though. Sure. All right. So I go in with him. He wants you to join the Army. He starts to fill out everything, right? Um, and the second he asks about criminal charges, I tell him I have a uh, marijuana paraphernalia charge. Immediately he closes his book. He says, well, we can't take you. Any any drug charges uh, prohibit you from joining the military. Um, I'm like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. He's like, um, I'm like, what about the Navy? He's like, the Navy won't take you either. He's like, uh, the Marines might take you, though. And I literally told him. I'm not trying to get shot. And I got up and I walked out uh, because that's why I wanted to go into the Navy. So I didn't have to get shot at. Now, if we were in World War Two, it would be a different story. Mm-hmm. I'd get shot for a cause I believe in. I'm not going to get shot over a politician enriching himself over over like over whether or not um the Middle East is is basing their oil off the dollar or the ruble. You know, that brings up an interesting point, though, because if you can if you can see that in America that it's it is, you know, young boys fight rich men, rich older men wars. Right. Do you think that that there's something to that where it's like I have. So I view this as. Like a Mad Lib, right? You take out uh, Israel, Palestine, replace with Russia, Ukraine, right? Replace America, Iraq, America. Afghanistan, America, 200 other countries that we should have never invaded. Um, it, I don't, I don't think the people of these regions want this to happen. I think the, I think, I think the leadership on both sides is fucking around. And I think the leadership on both sides, just like you mentioned in World War One, where they had all these treaties, where it's like, oh, that set off the dominoes, right? Yep. Well, who's allied to Israel? Who's allied to the Middle East? And I think, I think, I think, I think that they want this to happen. I think that they want human suffering. I want, I think that they want, I don't, I don't think it's about land. They, they do. And Israel for the United States is very, I, I would compare it to. Is, Israel's to, very influential to the United States. I would compare it to, I mean, at least politically, like politically, economic, you know what I mean? Like, I mean. Let me put it, how do I put it? Like, if I was a general, let's say, and I had to look at it like this, right? I would look at Israel very similarly to how I would look at Japan. Japan is our ally. 
uh, in uh, that part of Asia. Okay, we need Japan. We very much need Japan in case something pops off with China. Japan is a good strategic location. Yeah. You know, and it's good to have them allied to us. Okay. I think the same thing in the Middle East for Israel. The American government doesn't care what Israel does because the middle, because that's our, that's, that's our powerhouse in the Middle East. That's how we can exert our control in the Middle East is through Israel. So whatever Israel does, the the whether and they have it, nuclear it, weapons it, it tanked it tanked biden's i mean biden was already a bad candidate but biden had no chance biden had no chance after because it makes him look terrible genocide joe but guess what biden's hands are tied you know why because he can't do nothing about it even no matter what he thinks personally Okay, no president is ever going to put any sanctions on Israel. Is ever going to. We pay for Israel to have free health care. We pay for Israel. The United States to, does. Yes, to have free education. You know we, we subsidize Israel's existence simply because they are our powerhouse in the Middle East. They are basically one giant military base we have in the Middle East. To exert surrounded by surrounded by Muslim countries, surrounded by Muslim countries that uh, the American government doesn't like. Man, uh, fuck, that's heavy. Now I want to say something about Russia because I have a controversial take on Russia. Okay? Be careful, my wife's Russian, straight off the boat. No, and this is why. Okay. Everybody wants to get on Russia. Oh, what Russia's doing is so bad. I don't agree with what Russia's doing either. But you have to look at what Russia's GDP is built off of. Russia's GDP is built off of natural gas. Okay. Now, what did they find huge amounts of reserves in Ukraine? Natural gas. Natural gas. Okay. To look at it. Look, 30 years ago, what was Russia? Look at it. Look at it from put yourself in the in the Russian government shoes, okay. Um, Ukraine allies with NATO. I don't think that they're worried um, militarily. What they're worried about is economically. Um, Ukraine allies with NATO becomes becomes part of NATO, right? They have not yet. They I mean, have they're, not. They're yet. like they're like they're friendly, but they're not an yeah. official member of NATO. Then, then they help they help uh, Ukraine get their natural gas. Now the the um the European countries, right? Um, what would that be? The Western European countries. Now yeah. they no longer have to rely on Russian gas, which is the majority of their GDP. Now they can get it from Ukraine. That would tank the Russian economy. Well, and they That's, blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, which was coming from Russia to Germany. That's that's very dangerous. You know, who, you know who they just arrested today? A Ukrainian for that. Hmm. That's saying right. They, they said Russia blew up its own pipeline, but it seems like Ukraine did it. That's with it's, the help of the Americans. It's very it's very dangerous. <clears throat> OK, for Russia to have. I think it's like I could be wrong. Maybe you might want to look it up. I think it's like 80 percent of their GDP is natural gas. It's a huge amount. Energy. Energy, it's a yeah. huge amount of their GDP. Imagine uh, imagine us as a country, 80% of our yeah, GDP is gone. Keep talking while I look this up because I don't know. I kind of want to hear. They're, a huge amount of their GDP is based off of their export of natural gases into um, Europe. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yes, they attacked Ukraine and yes, they want the Ukraine as, as part of Russia. A big part of it has to do with economics well, it's they're always trying, it they're, they're, but they're trying to prevent their entire co economy from collapsing mm -hmm. basically that's how I understand it I'm not saying I agree with what Russia is doing but 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 let's not forget that America waged what a 20 year war in the Middle East simply because the Middle East wanted to um wanted to move from the petrol dollar to a new to bank the ruble, to the ruble. Well mm -hmm. they they wanted that's how they that's why they killed Gaddafi in Libya because he wanted to start an African bank. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that threatened what? That threatened part of America's GDP. It well, every everything, like every war is about money. It's all about economics. It has nothing to do with homeland or power per se 
maybe power maybe, as maybe, it pertains to maybe economics. to the citizens it does, but not to the powers that be. That, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like you know, like I'll defend my home to the hilt, but you know, our country looks at a way to keep our country strong and powerful. The people at the top, you know, whether they be Republican, Democrat, whatever they are, it's all about power. Um, you know, one thing that I wanted to ask you is like. You know, I always like to get different people's perspectives on how they see things, because sometimes, you know, like you, you there's three sides to the story. Yours, mine and the truth, yep. you know, and so um, I, I, I like to ask different people their opinions. Like, what were your thoughts um, on October 7th when all those images started coming in of what was happening? Like what, what went through your mind? Did you convert at that by then? Uh, I was already con- I was already uh, they call it reverting because they, because we believe that everybody came from Islam. They just lost their way. Okay, so we, right. so we I didn't know that. Yeah, we view it as reverting. You're reverting back to the way of Allah. You're reverting back to God. You just lost your way. Um, so just real quick, uh, leading. If you want, Mike, you can look over here too. That's the same oh, image. Oh, okay. Uh, leading natural gas exporting countries in 2023 by export type in billion yeah, cubic Russia, meters. Right? United yeah. States is 203.5 billion cubic meters. Russia is number two at 138. Uh, Qatar. Norway, Australia, Canada, Algeria, Turkmenistan, Indonesia, and Nigeria. Turkmenistan is crazy. Turkmenistan um is is like the Turkmenistan is worse than uh, North Korea uh with its dictatorship and it it it's it's sub- it, and their their natural gas is the only reason why their their government even exists. Dan, what's the difference between the light blue and the dark blue? Yeah, I'd like to know that too. Uh expand statistic. Okay. Uh, LNG exports. What's LNG? Pipeline exports. Um, I'm assuming anything that's not going through the pipeline. I'm assuming LNG. Let's look up what LNG means. And my phone's not working. Dan, can you do a quick? Hold on. What does LNG mean? We're having fun here, boys. Let's look it up. Let's look it up. LNG mean. LNG means. Uh, liquid natural, n- liquefied natural gas. My bad. Okay, so liquefied natural gas. Oh, you know what? Uh, that's PA. Mm-hmm. That's Pennsylvania. That they won't let us drill. Wow, Russia's so Russia's pipeline and liquid natural gas. The only country with more pipeline is Norway. <clears throat> That's yeah, nuts. And Qatar has the most liquefied natural gas. Or uh, I mean, Canada's comparatively, all pipeline. Nigeria's all. No, no, Canada's all liquid. Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. Liquid. Australia's. Okay, so okay, all liquid energy. This yeah. is this is all about energy. Uh, basically, but from what I understand, um, no matter because this is and this is and, and keep in mind this is all going off a youtube video i watched of someone trying to explain the uh economic reasons for russia going to war with ukraine that came out well, shortly did after you, the did war you hear began. anything did you hear anything else or just that um can i offer you another hypothesis I, I i've i've heard quite a bit um but that's the one that makes most sense to me so um one of the major things in the ukraine is uh, the Black Sea, right? Up since since the fall of uh, the Soviet Union, that was a port, right? They don't have any other ports really, except for up north, which is treacherous and it's hard to get through. Yes, right now, Russia is the largest landmass country in the world. They're massive. Um, so in in nineteen ninety one, I believe it was. Um, there was a deal made at the end, at the fall of the Berlin Wall, at the fall of the Soviet Union, where the United States made a deal with the Russians. And this was, this was, this was kind of a, like a linchpin for them. If they, if the United States didn't agree to this, Russia was not going to disband. What was stated was NATO was started for Russian aggression, right? So it was, it was a, a so that Stalin, couldn't do what Hitler did, right? Which I don't know why they were an ally with us. It doesn't make any sense. And then they become an enemy. So what they said in 1991 was was uh, NATO will not move an inch east towards Russia. That was the deal. Since then, they've moved like 27,000 miles, which is all the way up to Ukraine. Now, Ukraine is at, at 
literally at the border of Russia. It used to be Russia. And that was always the red line for Putin. Putin said, we, we've acquiesced to everything that you guys have said. Ukraine is our red line. If you, if you take Ukraine, if you make Ukraine NATO, we will be forced to push our hand. It's the same thing as like Russia moving into Vancouver. You know, we'd be like, no, 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 we're not doing that. That's not happening. So being that, that was what was going on. Putin had a hard line for at least over a decade saying no. Now, what happened between 2014 and uh, 2014 was the coup in Ukraine. Between 2014 and 2020, uh, Donetsk and the Donbass, which is the right part, the closer to Russia part, um, that's the they had a referendum and they said we are we are going to retain our Russian heritage, even though we are in Ukraine. They voted to have their their language be Russian, not Ukrainian, because all those elderly people and their kids grew up in Russia. So what happened after 2014 was 14,000 ethnic Russians were murdered by the Ukrainians with missiles and incursions, incursions that none of us knew about in eastern Ukraine. So the Ukrainians were killing the eastern Ukrainians. Putin was going, stop fucking doing that. And they didn't stop doing that. And then the Americans somehow convinced them to go right up to the edge. And Putin pushed back. There was going to be a ceasefire. And you could see on the map, you could see in time and on the map that Putin pulled all of his troops back because he wanted to appreciate the ceasefire and they were going to have peace and they were going to sign an agreement. It was all settled. This was in like the first month of the war. And then the United States sends Boris Johnson over from Mm -hmm. England to poo-poo the deal, yep. and you now have eight hundred thousand Ukrainians are dead, men and boys. The average fighting age of a Ukrainian man is forty-four, and they're conscripting people now. The mentally handicapped, they've canceled their elections. The Ukraine. Well, don't forget, within the first couple of weeks of the in in twenty twenty one, the new Biden administration made an announcement that they want to pull. Ukraine into NATO violating that treaty agreement. Correct. This I, like this is all fucked. And I knew I knew about the uh, war is the, money. I knew about the treaties. I knew that um NATO kept on pushing and pushing and pushing. Um uh I I was unaware that they were killing Russians there. Um yeah, 2014 so, to 2020. So that, that seems like that could have been more the tipping point. When I when I was mentioning the the gas imports and stuff like that, I always kind of felt like that was like the tipping point. Obviously, there was more going into it, but I always thought like from like the Russian government's perspective, that always made the m- most sense to me. Like, oh, NATO keeps pushing, keeps pushing, keeps pushing. Mm-hmm. Oh, and now you're threatening the GDP of our entire country, and you might crash our ruble. Okay, we're they're done. making they're, more money. They're making more money now. They made deals with China and India. They're, they they got rid of. Oil across the world was traded on the American dollar. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. We have lost the ability to control the market the United States has. Uh, Actually, and and another uh, part of that is... um the the thing uh, that that uh, that Tur- Dan had that, that yeah. Dan had um that he got of, rid of already Tur- of uh, Turkmenistan um I watched the whole video on the whole history of Tur- uh, Turkmenistan um so the there Tur- we go so the Turkmenistan thing oh hover over you can hover over and do stuff yeah oh yeah yeah hover over the the line go 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 to Turkmenistan Does Dan that pull up anything you're you're trying to choose it on the TV no I was switching over there pipeline thirty nine point five Okay, it just brings up more suspicions. Okay, so Turkmenistan. So after the fall of the Soviet Union, um, Turkmenistan uh, kept on being le- led by basically the guy who was put in charge by the by the Soviet Union, um, and his whole idea was to uh, enrich the country because they because their natural gases had always basically gone from straight from uh, Turkmenistan from a pipeline straight to Russia to be processed um why this guy I forget his name why uh the leader of Turkmenistan never just built the infrastructure to refine his own natural gas probably because they wouldn't let him makes no sense to me no 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 when they became an independent country 
that's what I mean. Like, why not just but anyway? Independent so, countries still have other countries telling them what to do. Well, yeah, of course, of course. But so, but in I think uh, the two thousand mid two thousand something like that. Um, uh, and I just watched this video yesterday, and it's like, but uh, the the big thing that caught my eye is that they built um two huge pipelines in the last like 15, 20 years, um, straight to China. To circumvent yeah. Russia, they they built two pipelines, the longest pipelines they've ever built, straight to China. Um, uh, so that's why I'm not surprised that that China is starting to take over the market because a lot of people are just sending their gas straight to China. It's it's people need to realize that most, I'd say, 99.9 percent of wars is not things that people want. I think it's I think it's people at the top doing stupid shit, causing policies or destruction or murder or whatever under the under the under the guise of we need to do this or, you know, it's the right thing to do. National security, shit like that. And I think I think ninety nine point nine percent of the time it doesn't need to happen because people don't sit and have the conversation. Well, from the from the dawn of I think from the dawn of like. I don't know about man, but the dawn of like nation states. Um, well, you're, I mean, you're going back twelve thousand years ago. It, it, I think that it's the the weaponization of like of like um, uh, of like either religion or or um, God, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, or ideologies, mm-hmm. right? The weaponization of that to justify to the people what the people in power want to do. That's that's always been the case because you can't you can't go to your people and say, um, uh, I want all of you to risk your lives and die because I want some of that material over there in that other country. No, no, no. You have to sell it to them like no, no, this is an existential crisis or or this is better for them or like uh, or or we're going to liberate them. There's always some type of excuse. There's always some type of way. For something the, else. Exactly. That the yeah. people in power are going to weaponize either an ideology or religion or something to whip people up into a fervor so that they're willing to die. So that they're willing to die for people who are never going to put their lives at risk and benefit the most from it. And, 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 I, and I think a lot of the times it's never the reason why they tell you. No, no, no. Of course It's not. always another reason. So that makes me, that makes me question Israel Palestine. What is the real reason? Because they have a hard, hard, hard history of lying to us. So what is the real reason over there? Why are they doing what they're doing? The, from what I understand from you know, the Palestinians who I've met, um, they just don't want their land stolen from them. Now, that's coming from their mouths, though. I, I can't get in the head of people who, you know what I mean? Like, one, I can't get into the head of other people. Well, I mean, let's two, let's let's hypothesize for a two, second. What two. could it be? What could it be? Because I, I don't think it's about land. I. I don't know, because like I because a big a big thing, a big driving factor for most wars are resources, like you said, economy, a lot. It's, it could it be as simple? Could it be as simple as as Palestine has beachfront property? I doubt it. And doubt Israel's it. like, man, we could build condos. I, I, I doubt it. I doubt it. I, I don't understand, like, from the Palestinian perspective, who have absolutely no political power right now. Um, say, say, say they made a wish to Allah. Allah, you know, please get get rid of uh, Israel, and by some miracle, Israel disappeared off the face of the map today. Not like was just. Poof, out of existence, right? Yeah, and uh, and the Palestinians regain the territory. I don't see what resources they have to benefit from. It's it's a it's a fucking desert. They have it's a fucking there. desert with what's there. I don't understand what's there. I I mean, even when the I, I think even when the um the the like like when um Great Britain. Uh, gave the territory to the Zionists, you know, the Zionists and the and their movement to like, oh, you can you can move all the Jews here. Um, like Great Britain isn't some like, I mean, they're they're one of the biggest colonial powers that's ever existed in history. Do you think if Palestine had anything worthwhile that they would have just been like, oh yeah, Jews, you can have it? I feel like they did that because they saw no meaningful 
financial resources there that they could plunder. So they were like, this land is useless to us as an empire. This is this is what you can have. So aren't a weird way we making an argument for them, for everybody to be like, just leave. Because what, what is there? Other than people who have um, an ancestral, you know. Is there a religious? Do you think there's a religious aspect to it? You know, where it's like the, what's it, the. Well, the Church of Christ, whatever that is, there it's like the um, from do you know what I'm talking about, like in Jerusalem, yeah. like the Wailing Wall, and like there's like the Abrahamic the religions. Mount. The Abrahamic religions have many religious sites there. You, you are right. Um, uh, the, the Each big, different faith does. The, the big resource would definitely be the the um the histor the um holy sites, um, and I I I know, and I'm and trust me I, when I say. That like this, I'm, just because I'm Muslim, I'm not trying to make excuses for for Muslims. Because I actually later want to get into a lot of my problems with certain aspects of my own religion. So I'm so I can be clear. I'm not trying to be biased here. Um, so like, well, like right after this, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. So like with um uh with the Jewish people, they feel like they have a claim to the land, right? That that's our land, right? But I'll, you know, God promised us that land. Um, with the Christians, they believe that, um, I don't know the whole story. They believe that another temple has to be built, uh, uh, that a, a certain amount of temples have to be destroyed and then rebuilt. And that is the sign of the second coming the, of Christ, the second coming of Christ. So that's why the fundamentalist Christians want, um, them there. They, uh, a lot of, uh, Zionists are actually not even Jewish. They're, they're fundamentalist Christians. And it's because oh, they, they believe they believe them. exactly they believe for the second coming of Christ that they need to have that land and they need to I think it's a Temple Mount that yeah. they need to rebuild another temple on the, uh, uh, a temple on the Temple Mount I I could be wrong about the location no I think you're pretty close yeah yeah so that that would usher in the second coming of Christ um having read the Quran nothing in the Quran states anything about anything about the holy sites or, or any Muslim having any claim to them. So it doesn't state anything. Um, wait, so you're saying in the Quran, there's nothing in there about there being any kind of Muslim holy sites within Israel? Basically, no. Basically, no. But they don't uh, have the like point, their one thing where the it's point, like, we need to fight for the, to, for the wailing to, wall. To, or? to the point, to the point that, um, and, uh, okay, so let's, let me take a step back from my own religious views here. Okay. So in the Quran, it states it's, uh, it's, um, uh, Surah 17. That would be like book 17, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that would be, uh, in English, it would be the night journey. Okay. Now, this is a story of Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, making it, uh, all the way to, um, Jerusalem in one night on horseback. But through the guidance, but through Allah, basically, um, uh, it said that um, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, if you believe it, was taken up to heaven. Allah showed him the kingdom of heaven, then took him to Jerusalem to show him Jerusalem and then took him back to um, uh, Arabia. OK, Um now, from what I understand, historically speaking, if you remove the religious context, the thought is that Muhammad did this, peace be upon him, Allah forgive, that Muhammad did this as a claim, as a, as a further way to connect um, his religious movement to the Abrahamic religious traditions. But you have to understand that when originally uh, us as uh, Muslims in the time of Muhammad very early on, from what I understand, um, we prayed towards Jerusalem, not towards the Kaaba, not towards Mecca. Okay. Um, when, when Muhammad wasn't, peace be upon him, when he wasn't, um, met with like the type of like open arms he felt he was going to by the, the Jewish and the Christian communities. Um, he changed uh, that to pray towards Mecca, Mecca, yeah, which was the exact opposite direction from Jerusalem. That's weird. So he basically told everybody, "You have to pray towards Mecca, pray towards the east, don't pray towards the west." So what? What? Because I have to, I we have like hard outs in a little bit. What? What are your criticisms? Um, my criticisms have to do with the hadith. So what's a, what's a hadith? that's I'm about yeah. to explain yeah. it. So, the so Quran, who's the hotter hadith sister? 
Is that what you're saying? I don't know what that. <laughs> so, so nice response. <laughs> Way to bring it right back to something serious. I like that. So, um, the Quran. It's a hadith, is, isn't it? The the Quran, the recitation is supposedly was documented within the time of Muhammad. Okay, mm-hmm. and um, and even if it wasn't written down, I can believe that the Quran still exists in its original state, given the fact that every year we have Ramadan and uh, the imams basically throughout the entire period of Ramadan recite the entire Quran from memory. And if, and I've seen like the, like pass down stories. So it's easy. So exactly. You, and I've yeah. seen, I've seen while we're praying and at the masjid say the, the, um, the imam, he's, he's, he's praying, he's doing his, his recitation, right? If he even gets one word wrong, you can guarantee that other Muslims behind him will correct him. No, 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 no. And then they'll correct him and then he'll correct himself. I believe that the, that the Quran exists in its original state. The Hadith are stories of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Okay. And for 200 years, okay, they accumulated 600,000 Hadiths. Stories of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 600,000. 600,000. And they were put in a position where they wanted to canonize the Hadith. Okay. So they went through all the Hadith, all the records, and they put in a criteria that you had, that there had to be either multiple witnesses in which there's only like three or four Hadiths where there are multiple witnesses, or we have to be able to trace it back from the lineage all the way to the Prophet Muhammad. Right. And doing that, doing that with only those criteria, they whittled it down to the Hadith that we rely on right now, uh, which is 7,200. So they whittled it down from 600,000 stories of the Prophet Muhammad to seven hundred to 7,200, meaning the vast majority of those were just made up. And the and to me and to me and to me, the other seven seven thousand two hundred is a game of telephone that y'all were playing for two hundred years. Okay. The hadith, the hadith can't and, and Muslims are going to be pissed at me for this. A stuck for law. That means Allah forgive. Okay. The the hadith can't agree on whether Muhammad, peace be upon him, told his disciples to pee while standing up or sitting down. Okay. If you can't agree whether or not we're supposed to, one hadith says that he said to piss standing up. Another hadith says that he said to piss standing down. The hadith claimed that Muhammad was born with. It claims that. Are Muhammad, you looking at the camera? <laughs> it claims that Muhammad was born without foreskin. The the Quran makes it very no 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 Muslims. I'm a Muslim too. The Quran makes it very clear that Muhammad was just a man. Okay, during another thing that bothers me is during Ramadan, the the Imams like to state that Muhammad was perfect. Muhammad was a man. He wasn't perfect. The, to me, you're deifying him at that point. Nobody's perfect but Allah. So how is that not sinful? Okay. Okay. The Hadith also claims, the Hadith also claims, and you'll see that some, some Muslims will, will, will justify child marriage. The Hadith also, this is what sent me down the, the rabbit hole of, 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 of investigating the Hadith. The Hadith claims that, uh, Muhammad's second wife, um, uh, Aisha, okay, was six years old at the time that she was married and nine at the time of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, copulation of, uh, of, um, of, uh, Wait, was she having a baby called? conception? Uh, no, no, no. Of, um, when when you have sex with somebody of um what's the word virgin no when when you when, when, when you, you consecrate the marriage consummation consummation, consummation. Yeah. consummation yeah at the time of consummation that she was nine so either i have to believe that muhammad was peace be upon him had sex with a nine-year-old or i have to believe that your hadith is wrong so i believe that the hadith is wrong so that's not in the quran that's in the no, hadith. that is not in the quran that is in the hadith Oh, and 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 see, people, we're learning today. And people have done studies into the hadith. Okay, there's only one hadith that claims that Moh- that Aisha was that young, and it was by a guy who had a political motivation. Okay, because there was a lot of infighting. It, it still happens today between the Sunnah and the Shia. Okay, on who rightfully sh- has claim to to Muhammad's kingdom. Right, peace be upon him. One of the ways that they justified the Sunnah, the Sunnah, the Sunni, okay, having that right is that Aisha was a virgin. 
it was because most of Muhammad's wives were divorcees. All oh, of his wives, okay. all of his wives, from what I understand, were divorcees except Aisha. Wait, how many wives did he have? I'm not 100 percent sure. More than multiple, one, but he had multiple. But he had multiple. The, the the Quran states that you can have multiple wives. Hold on. But you have but you have to treat each wife equally. So if you buy something for one, you have to equally buy it for the Hadith twist is a big twist because now it starts to call into question a lot of things that some people think about Islam. Is it in the Quran or is it in the Hadith? Exactly. Oh, and this a lot is of people, spicy. And, uh, and a lot of people conflate the two. And yes, yes. And on top of that. Um, fundamentalist Muslims, like my, like one of my Palestinian brothers. Okay. He will, he will tell me, he will defend the Hadith till the day he dies. He will tell me that the, the 7,200 of them, they, 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 yeah, he will, he will tell me, and a lot of Muslims will, a lot of fundamentalist Muslims will. Um, he'll tell me that the, that the Quran is, is here. Okay. It's the highest level. Okay. And the Hadith is right here. These are stories of the Prophet Muhammad. If, if Allah, wanted y'all to document the life of the prophet muhammad okay don't you think he would have ordained it don't you think he would have told you to do it don't yeah, you follow think me that, and tell don't the stories. you think don't you think that would have been in the quran in the recitation and it's not and it's not you're talking about 200 years of playing telephone muslims who see this are not going to be happy with me about this but okay, another one. I forget what the name of it is, but uh, it has to do with the because I went was down a rabbit hole. So, uh, part of the hadith states that um, once again, you're you're almost making you're 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 crossing the line and idolizing Muhammad. Okay, it states that Muhammad will come back almost like a second coming of Christ before before uh, Judgment Day. Nothing in the Quran states that. Do you think if that was the case that 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 Allah would have put that in the recitation? I think so. I think so. Especially when the Quran specifically states that on the day of judgment, okay, all the prophets will be there. Not before the day of judgment. Not to usher in the day of judgment that they will specifically be there. Muhammad and all the and you know Moses and Jesus will all be there on the day of judgment, where we're all resurrected. And we'll all judge by Allah for our sins. And we'll either let into Jannah or we're stricken to hell. Just just the discrepancies between the Quran and the Hadith, right? How much I don't even strife know. does this cause within the, in the Muslim faith? It seems like none. It seems like none because the fundamentalist Muslims hold the Hadith so, so just tell me, as high as the Quran. D define a, funda a fundamentalist Muslim. What is, what is that? Because I would think it would be the opposite. I would think a fundamentalist would want to hold on to the fundamentals, which would be the Quran. But they, but they, view, they view them almost as one and the same. Like they, they almost, they, the, they, they hold they the Quran. Do, they, they hold the Hadith. Uh, like a, a centimeter higher than the Hadith. Yeah, basically, basically, yeah. because like the look and I don't understand why, because the Quran at the end of the day, like the Bible is full of stories and parables. Um, The Quran really isn't. The Quran has a few stories and parables. But for the most part, the Quran is basically a guide on how to live your life. It goes through stuff like women's rights. It goes through stuff like um, how your inheritance is to be divided amongst your relatives. It goes through stuff like how you're to be buried. It goes to the 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 Quran is has answers for everything that you need in life and how you should live your life. Um, so I don't understand why the Hadith is so important. Why do you need to? What? Of course, Muhammad. Sure peace be upon him would have set an example but if you can't trust the stories that those examples are supposed to be based off of how, how are you going to trust the whole thing how am i going to trust it i don't understand how how other muslims expect me to trust this i trust the quran because the quran was was passed down to muhammad peace be upon him by the angel gabriel i can i can believe that I can believe that. I can't believe that a game, a, a telephone played over two hundred years has any has, has any merit. I'm sorry, I can't. Do you do you, do you have arguments with people about this or dis, uh, like no, disagreements? I'm a, no, I'm afraid to. Why? Not that I fear that I'm going to be attacked, but these are my brothers and sisters, and I just don't want to get into some stupid heated argument over over our belief system. But can't there be a discussion about it, like a, a reasonable discussion? It's like. Uh, I've tried to, I tried to with my, with my, um, 
with my Muslim brother, Muhammad, when I learned about the story of Aisha and it didn't end well. And it didn't end well because he was basically trying to, he was basically trying to justify child rape. Which I, we're all against. Does that frustrate and, you? Yes, it does frustrate me. It frustrate me. And that's, does it frustrate you because the conversations can't be had? Uh, yes. Yes. Because, because especially with people who grew up Muslim, um, they're taught that the Hadith is just as sacred as the Quran. So that, so that's, that's what they believe. That's what they believe. But, but they don't put any type of, um, uh, critical thinking, critical into thinking into it. Now, look, a lot. Yes. The Quran, you have to take it on a lot of faith. Like any religious text, I can take that faith because I know that God is real. I, I, I've seen things in my life and felt things in my life that tells me that God is real. So I can believe that. But but if you're telling me that I need to I need to base my decision making off of like I said I'm going to repeat a game a game of telephone that happened over 200 years before the canonization of the hadith I can't trust that how am I how can I trust that I don't understand how y'all expect me to trust that I take the hadith as stories that's it as stories like meant parables. to be meant to be moral parables because a lot of the hadiths I've heard basically come down to that. Oh, this is a story about Muhammad. Like one of them was a story about uh, Muhammad and this little kid. I'm not going to go into, but this little kid had happened to see a woman naked by accident and he ran off crying into the, into the mountains and Muhammad had to go looking for him. Peace be upon him. And he had to go looking for him. And then he found him because the shepherd was like, Oh, this little kid keeps on coming down for a glass of milk, but then he'll go right back up to the mountain. And Muhammad had talked to him and it's okay that you saw a naked woman. Allah's not going to send you to hell. Okay. That's a nice story. Is basically saying don't go like, seek out naked women, but it's seek okay. Out that, naked yeah. women, but if you see, like Allah is forgiving, Allah is all merciful. I can understand those. I do. I, do I believe that necessarily actually happened? Probably not. But I, I understand the the purpose of the story. Why? Why isn't there a way for? I mean, maybe there used to be a way, but now it just seems too difficult no. for everybody to sit down and people of different faiths. It just talk to each other about this stuff. I'm learning I, so much stuff I, from you. I, I don't I don't know. And another thing, another thing I want to bring up is um I forget this is another thing that that like this would have been in the Quran. Okay. Along with like Muhammad coming back before the day of judgment. Okay. I forget what year it was, but there was an attack on um on the Kaaba, on uh, on Mecca, where a group of Muslims took over the Kaaba, took over the, the sacred mosque in Mecca. All right. At gunpoint. OK, they did this because they thought that this 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 guy um, was um, I forget the name that they use. But basically, the Hadith states that there's another guy who's completely separate from Muhammad is also supposed to come back to usher in the 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 end times. Right. Once again, it just sounds like people trying to cut uh, trying to um, compete with Christianity. So they're making up Hadiths. You know, within the 200 year time span after the Prophet Muhammad to, to argue with Christians basically on why they're wrong. That's what it sounds like. It's like, oh, Jesus is supposed to come back before the time, uh, before judgment day. No, 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 no. You know, Muhammad also told us, peace be upon him, that he, no, no, he's going to come back before the, you see what I mean? It sounds like a lot of ways to argue with other religious people that maybe were made up by his followers and after his death. I am fascinated. Are okay. you fascinated? But, but 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 the point but the point but the point is that these people took over the sacred mosque at gunpoint believing this. A lot a, 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 a falsity. A falsity. It has to be a falsity because Allah would not have would not have told us stuff that would have led to someone taking over our sacred holy site at gunpoint. So Do you want to say something? Yeah, I have a question. Go. What is the difference between Allah, God, and Yahweh? They're all the same. Thank you. They're all the same. That's the thing. They're, they, it's all just different names for God, <clears throat> the one God. And do you think that like the the big differences between um, Islam, uh, Christianity, and all of its forms, and Judaism is just three different pathways to the same end conclusion? Basically, basically, and and how and how you choose to worship that one God. Mm -hmm. I, I will never understand how we're all how these three religions all come from the the same source. All all worship the same God, and yet we'll kill each other mercilessly over how you worship Him. 
Sounds crazy. When 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 the Torah, the New Testament, and the Quran sp- expressly forbid killing. And here's another thing I want to I want to uh, uh, preach, sorry. brother. Whatever you want to do this is the airing the grievances. Here's Go. another thing I want to. I'll fest- sit back. It's we'll sit festivus. Back. <laughs> it's festivus. Here's, There's your go, camera. Go. Yeah. Here's another thing that I want to um uh, to 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 make clear. Oh, uh, crap. Hold on. See now. I'm sorry. Now, yeah, I'm sorry. I got really excited. My, my train of thought here. Here's another thing that I wanted to. I, I know. So the. Um, the uh yeah so so people killing each other over the same religion and 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 how you choose to to to, to worship uh, uh 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 god um no it's gone i'm sorry no, you're, you're i'm right. sorry you're right. it's, it's, i'm sorry um it'll come back though it, it will come back i it, it just i you're very you how, know what you're very passionate about this I, how like Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, okay. So some people claim. <laughs> nice. Some people claim. Some people claim that the that the uh, Quran. Okay, the recitation. Okay, prohibits killing of non-Muslims. That is factually wrong. It's wrong. Okay, the Quran strictly prohibits killing of another man unless it's by legal means meaning you committed a crime like you killed another person and legally you've been sentenced to death okay so where where does the now, where now does all the that come from then? comes from the fact that during the time of the prophet muhammad this is in the quran okay uh the pagans okay were attacking muslims uh, around mecca and trying to attack uh the, the the holy mosque okay so there is a stipulation within the quran that states and very specifically it states that okay if if on your way to the holy mosque this is very specific if you're on your way to the holy mosque on a pilgrimage okay and people are trying to stop you from going there or, tr- or or trying to kill you, you are allowed to defend yourself and kill them. Not that you can just kill people. It was basically stating to his followers in that very specific time period, in that very specific circumstance, if you are making the pilgrimage to Mecca and the, and, uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the, somebody was trying to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the pagans and the pagans are trying to prevent you from going there and are trying to kill you because he was at war with the pagans. Basically, in wartime, he was saying during this time of war, if you are attacked, defend yourself. And if you need to kill somebody to defend yourself, then then you are justified in the eyes of Allah. That sounds like a very American thing. Thank you. Person or property. Thank you. Um, can I? I want to ask you this. Sharia law. What does that mean? So Sharia law is within the Quran. Um, a lot of it comes down to um, basically very biblical, eye for an eye. Like, uh, and yes, if you steal, it, the Quran does state that you cut off the 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 left hand and the uh, and the right foot. You uh, well, not necessarily the left hand, but it basically says that you cut off the hand and the foot on the opposite sides. They they do not to, to like what imbalance they, you. As whatever, whatever the thought process as a, as is behind a punishment, that. punishment, basically. Oh, so you can't run to steal if you stole again. Maybe, 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 maybe. maybe or, and the hand, so you can't, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, like, some, really, like, that's one of the most brutal things in the Quran, and it specifically has to do with stealing, which, like, if anybody's ever had their shit stolen, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. Well, there's, okay, so there's a lot of people in America who are really concerned about Sharia law. Should they be concerned about Sharia law? Not in America. Not in America because well, in, there's, because there's, in America there's Muslims separa- here that a, want to do it. We have a separation of church and, church and state, and it needs to stay that way. Um, I, I'm going to be honest. I'm um, looking at the camera again. Uh, I will never live in a Muslim country. Why? Because of Sharia law. Because we they don't have the freedoms that I have in America. I believe in freedom. I believe in your freedom to worship however you want. I believe in the separation of church and state. So. If there's a country that's run by any religion, it's not just a Muslim religion, really. It's any, but I don't know of any country that's run by a religious institution other than Muslim countries at this point. Most most countries have moved past that. Most countries are secular now. 
That's why I specifically say a Muslim country. But really, any country that's dictated by a religion, I will not live in. Oh, well, let me ask you a question on that, though. So you're a Muslim. Yes. You would never live in a Muslim country because of Sharia law. Not not necessarily because of Sharia law, just because I don't agree with the idea that that a religion has the right to run a state. There should be a separation between church and state because people should have the right to one, worship how they worship, and two, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be punished based on religious views. You should be paid. You should be punished based on the collective. A, a, a collective understanding by you know a, the community or a country, or however you want to. Yeah, put we say it. this is wrong collectively. We say this is wrong collectively, and we agree collectively this should be your punishment. That's how laws should be set forth and reinforced. So, because religious, for me, religion is your own personal thing, and it should not affect anybody else. And even the Quran, even the Quran states that us as Muslims um cannot cannot forcefully convert anybody I it is that. against it is against the quran to forcefully convert somebody it's not against other religions to do that though god knows allah knows that especially the roman catholics who i used to be roman catholics the inquisition that they forced a lot of people into their religion but was that from the book or was that from the people probably the people but i don't know the one the ones who who who've worked their way up to power you see, you see, I've read all of the Quran. I have not read all of the Bible. Basically, the only most thing haven't. I, both, mostly, the only thing I've read of the Bible are the Gospels because I wanted to know about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Peace be upon him. I read the Gospels. Other than that, I haven't read the Bible, so I don't know if there's a prohibition against forcing your religion on other people in the Bible. But I know for a fact, for a fact, um, that you that uh, within the Quran, it is strictly forbidden. To con to forcefully convert people to our religion, um, so much so that that it states time and time again that um that uh, the people who will find their way to Allah are basically destined to find their way to Allah. How, how does somebody who's a Muslim know that they're going to heaven? Well, well how I do they how do they assume or how do they know? Well, how, I mean, he he would say he knows. Like I I would say I would say I know because I just feel in my heart and soul that I am because I'd never done anything that I feel has been a mortal sin. There's only one time in my entire life that I did anything in my life that I felt I would have to answer for to God. And this was before I became a Muslim. Um and you don't have to say you don't have to no, say No, 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 it's fine cuz y'all probably going to laugh at me. Okay? I promise I won't I, go. I had a pellet I promise I might. I had a pellet gun and a few years ago I shot and killed a squirrel. And okay. I felt hmm, they're good eating. Extremely bad but that's the thing. Now maybe if I had eaten it I would yeah. have felt bad. I because shot, there's respect I, for the animal. I shot it for no other reason than to test out the power of my pellet gun. I felt terrible for it. I felt like that would be something I would have to. I killed one of Allah's, one of God's innocent creatures for for justifiably no reason. So I feel like that's something I might have to answer for. Other than that, I don't believe I, I honestly I don't believe I've done anything in my entire life that that risks my soul going to hell. I not, wouldn't not that not that not that like Allah wouldn't forgive me for the 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 killing of one of his innocent creatures. I also believe that he'll forgive me for, but I feel like that was a way like a step way above like I don't know like jerking off. You know what I mean? <laughs> if that's I, a sin, I am out of Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. The Quran states nothing about jerking off. Oh, as alaykum, my brother. <laughs> that's another thing. That's, no, no, no. I'm not gonna lie. As alaykum, salam. I'm not gonna lie. When I read the Quran, it say, stated nothing. It stated nothing about jerking off, and I, I was kind of happy well, about that. Listen, I don't know how I don't know how Allah would treat you, but God will forgive you. But, <laughs> Sorry, mom. But, <laughs> yeah, can you imagine that? Well, what relationship would be? Uh, which one has jerking off? Yeah. I'll go with that one. Yeah. So, 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 but I think maybe there's a hadith that forbids it because, like. Like, I think because like like Muslims have told me that jerking off is a sin, but like I said, nothing within the recitation ever mentions anything about uh, jerking off to the extent that when it talks about um, because you need to cleanse yourself before you pray. You can't just pray. You have to do a, a, what's called wudu, which is a, a ritualistic cleanse with water, right? A ritualistic cleanse with water. Um, so much so that it states that um, if you're with your wife. You have to take a full bath. I agree with but that. But it also makes a distinction that if you ejaculate, you also are in a full state of impurity and you need to bathe. Why would the Quran make that make the uh, make the the distinction between being with your wife? Because you adultery is a sin. 
So sex with your wife versus ejaculation. It literally makes that distinction between ejaculation. When to bathe. Ejaculation and being with your wife. So it's obviously not one and the same. So to me, that's basically saying you're free to jerk off, but don't pray and jerk off. <laughs> if you jerk off, then you're in a full state of impurity. You can't just do a normal wudu. You have to fully bathe. Well, I can tell you this. The New Testament doesn't say anything about it, but the Old Testament and the Torah do forbid it. Well, I, I guess the I, Christians are happy too, though. <laughs> the amazing, the amazing thing is that like all of these, the Abrahamic religions all come from basically the same source. Yes, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Why, why are they all fucking fighting? That's an answer I can't give you. I can, but isn't that insane? I, it's it's a family feud. I don't Abraham, think Abraham, so. Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had two sons. They were Ishmael and Isaac. I'm, I'm not sorry. Yeah. Am I getting that right? Ishmael and Isaac. Whatever. Internet. Yeah. We don't know. We're guessing. <laughs> and there was basically a family feud between those two brothers over who had like the right to the family line. And the one that was given it, um, Isaac, became the lineage. I might have screwed all those names up. I but think you're on the right path. Abraham's had one. Abraham had two sons. Isaac and Ishmael. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, Ishmael was the older um, from, but I believe it was Abraham's. Does that fracture Abraham's. from? Mm -hmm. And then Isaac was from a concubine, and that's where the Jewish lineage comes through. The, uh, I guess, Arab it would be, um, lineage comes through um, Ishmael, I believe. I, this, I could be butchering this. And then I think it was basically just a family feud that evolved over centuries and centuries i i i think i think so too because the the holy the holy mosque the kaaba um was was built by one of the the sons of abraham i think yeah is what it states yeah one of their sons uh, if not both of them but i know that the kaaba was was supposedly constructed by yeah so by i think one of Ishmael, the sons of abraham that kind of went the route of the muslim religion and then judaism came out of the other but, but the thing is that the that the muslim religion doesn't date back to to like the time of um uh the the judaism and stuff like that mm -hmm. um uh or even Islam, Christianity. Yeah, at the yeah. Beginning it, of Islam. It. Islam is only one thousand four hundred years old. Yeah, six hundred AD, right? Yeah. yeah, something like that. Yeah, with Muhammad. So Muhammad, is there? Peace be upon him. Yes. Is there? I number one. I had no idea what to expect talking to you. I had no idea if you were a psycho. I had no idea if you were not. a scholar. I had I I had no idea. Right. I took it on faith. Um, I'm incredibly impressed by the scope and the breadth of the knowledge and the passion that you have for it uh, to speak, to speak truth. Cause that's what this is all about. We're all supposed to sit around here and talk truth and not try. And, and, and if you get it, no one should be getting offended of it because it's just a conversation. There should be no consequences from this conversation. There should only be uh, hopeful bridge building or, or understanding mm -hmm. coming from this, you know? So I don't know what you expected, I don't know if we're going to, I don't know how the hell we can take anything out of context against you. <laughs> um, uh, staring down the camera like yeah, a yeah. hungry lion. I'm like, I'm like, all, right. <laughs> all right, go camera two. <laughs> I, um, um, but, but I have to go see my parents cause I'm leaving in two days. Um, final, final thoughts from you. Like if you had a message uh, out there, that you could get out there to people who have have listened to this conversation and and what 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 would be the thing that you'd want to get across to them about either either your faith the interpretation of the faith things are going on in Israel Palestine uh it, it uh misunderstandings about the faith uh you know anything I'm a tr I'm a truth and hope guy because I think it leads to love and I think love is truth so whatever you want to convey. And you don't have to look at the camera. You can look at us, or you can look at the camera, man. It's been it's been yeah. fucking great so far. The, the only thing I had to the only thing I had to say. I mean, it's going to be very broad. Go, but uh, people need to be people need to stop hitting the gas online. Like we are, everything is very pol polarized, and, and and I think that people need to stop and realize that the government the government wants us to be polarized. It wants us to fight amongst ourselves, divide and conquer. Okay. The two party system. Okay. We need to, we need to not fall into their traps. 
And we need to be able to do this more often. We need to be able to come together, have reasonable conversations, and see how we can fix the socioeconomic problems of our, of our day through understanding and through compromise. And unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen with, 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 with who we have in power right now. And I don't know how good voting does anymore, given how they, they've set everything up. All I can hope is that over time, we can make better decisions on who we put in power to try to fix this. But I, I'm sorry, I've always been of the mind that if you're going into politics, you're a scumbag. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It was common. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is just me. It's not it, just you. But it, <laughs> it, it, it used to be common knowledge when I was a kid that you don't trust a politician. Ever since the rise of social media, we've turned celebrities out of these scumbags. Why? Ain't that the truth, man? Why are we doing that? It used to be common knowledge that you don't trust these people, that these people are blood sucking parasites. Stop turning them into into celebrities. Don't give them your vote. Can I can I ask you one final question that you don't have to answer? Yes. Trump or Harris? Neither. Neither. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I have never voted in my entire life because I, I, I've never. I it. If you just believed like, in voting, just, just, I know I believe in voting, but I also believe that it's also my right not to vote if I don't like either candidate. And and I ever since and anybody who's ever grew up with South Park and remembers the douche versus tor, douche douche versus turd episode, okay, <laughs> that that's that's how I view our political system. Every single year, you put up a douche and a turd, and then ask me to vote for one of them, <laughs> and then people get angry that I'm not going to vote for them. Put up somebody who isn't a douche or a turd, and maybe I'll vote. Well, like I can't stop laughing. I believe it was a turd sandwich. Oh, yeah, sorry, a turd sandwich. Yes. <laughs> Respect uh, to the political parties. Um, <laughs> look, you're absolutely right, man. You're absolutely right. Uh, I, I, I would love to. I hope. I hope after this conversation, world peace happens. And everybody gets along. Oh my god! And uh, you, you just made fans of us. Uh, I, I can speak for myself, man. Like I said, I was a little hesitant, but I, I'm, I'm grateful that you're here. Cool. And I'm very happy uh, that you're not a psycho. Uh, who was online? Um, but you're well versed. You're knowledgeable. You're passionate. You give a damn. Um, probably ninety eight percent of the things that you say, I agree with. I'd love to be back on again if y'all would have you. Me. We will have you back on. We just got to figure out a reason. Look, if World War Three happens with Israel and Palestine, you're my first fucking call, man. <laughs> <laughs> like if they start dropping nukes, I'm like, we got to call Mike real quick. Uh, you yeah, might be getting a yeah, call tomorrow. Yeah, because I have the, answer. yeah, yeah. I have the answers, yeah. of course. Yeah, but you can. But you seem to me as 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 uh, reasonable and pragmatic. Oh, you're yeah. passionate, but you're reasonable and pragmatic. Yeah, and you can communicate a, a point of view that a lot of people don't understand. Because a lot of people look at certain things about the Muslim religion and they just think the the negatives that we all see. And you're kind of giving a different side to that, which is it's refreshing. Thank you. So, um, man, I'm really happy you came today. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'm happy I came too. Uh, Thank you for having me. What is there a Muslim thing that I could say? Is there a Muslim thing that Dan can say so we can end it? No, no. Unfortunately, I He's learned. He's not allowed I, to speak. No, no I le- no. I learned this because a non-Muslim said uh, "Assalamu alaikum" to me, and I said "Wa alaikum salam." Apparently, we are not supposed to do that. Um, if a non-Muslim says uh, "Assalamu alaikum" to us, we just say "Wa alaikum." You're not supposed to wish. I, I don't understand why this is, but that that peace be upon us is supposed to be between brothers and sisters, and that's it. So, what can he say? Can he say "Assalamu alaikum"? No, I already did. He, he can say, but I can only say "walaikum." I can't say well, you can't. I can't say "walaikum well, salam." Okay. I can say to you, but I can't say to you, peace. Which means it's a religion of war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Of course. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Michael, thank you so much for. It being was a blast, here. man. Really, Seriously. really awesome. And uh, we end this with Dan. So, Dan, what a week. Oh, I thought you were going to say something like... I know, right? Yeah, you yeah. really disappointed oh, I was going to say something about showering and jerking off. I just couldn't get it together. <laughs> you can't get... Those are two heavy concepts for you to put together. <laughs> you dropped the Asalaam I, I would walk like, it was away from that one Before, that was really, Dan. like, very natural because it was right in there because I switched religions real quick there. 
Oh, my God. Oh. All right. Well, All thanks right. a lot, everybody. Thanks for being here. It was awesome. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.